Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and it's Monday, which means we are going beyond the lines. We are in downtown Honolulu, broadcasting live from the beautiful Think Tech Hawaii TV studio in the Pioneer Plaza. This show directly relates to my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and building winning teams. Today's special guest has been the head football coach for the Atlanta Falcons, SMU and the University of Hawaii, and he is the winningest coach in UH football history. He is the legendary coach June Jones, and today we are going beyond football. Coach June, Hi, Russell. great to have you yeah, here. Good to see you. How's everything been? Well, everything's going good, just in between uh, seasons in the CFL. I'm glad to be in Hawaii. Nice. Yeah. Now, I knew you grew up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. When did you first start playing football? I didn't start playing football until I was 12 years old. I uh, played every sport, hockey, golf, uh, baseball, basketball. I was a sports junkie, basically. <laughs> I, I read every newspaper. I knew every stat. I just wanted my whole life since I was four or five years old to be a professional athlete. And I didn't start playing football until I saw ABC television one day. Uh, Jim Plunkett was, uh, was playing quarterback, and he was tall, six foot four, which I am. And... Uh, I kind of realized when I got to that 12-year-old age, I was good at, at, at a lot of sports, but I knew that it was going to take speed. You had to be able to run to, to ever make it yeah. to the next level in any sport. And uh, I, I knew I couldn't run. Uh, so, <laughs> so what happened was I said, well, maybe I can be a quarterback. Okay. So when I was uh, 13, I started, my mom went and got me a couple of footballs, about four or five actually, I had them in a bag. And I couldn't, in those days, nobody was really passing the ball, so I couldn't even have any receivers. So I, <laughs> I just drew circles on the grade school brick wall, and I would throw balls by the hour. In fact, I remember in the summer, my fingers would actually start to bleed uh, as I threw so many balls. And I just got to the point where I could hit any dot. And so I was lucky enough to eventually get a chance to play in high school. Uh, I didn't have a lot of scholarships coming out, but the University of Oregon, University of Hawaii, Portland State, a couple of small, smaller schools offered me, and I chose the University of Oregon first, went there, found out that they had Dan Fouts and a bunch of other oh, quarterbacks, really? so Norval Turner was one of the quarterbacks there, and so I decided to transfer to the University of Hawaii, where I sat on the bench for another three years wow. and never really got to play, really made a decision that I was not even going to play football anymore. I'd get my degree and go to work for my father in the securities business. So I passed my securities exam, the principal's exam, and then I got a call one day late in the summer from Mouse Davis, uh, who remembered me in high school and said, would you want to play at Portland State? I told him no like three times. <laughs> and, uh, and then at the last minute, I saw the college football all-star game before the camp, and I kind of got the itch again. So I called him and said, would you take me you know, back out there? And so... Uh, receiver Mel Delora, who was uh, my teammate here at UH, was in Eastern Washington at the time, was going to go to Eastern Washington, and, and I talked him into come Portland State, and so the rest was history. We, we, Mel set records, and I set the, the all-time passing record in the history of NCAA uh, Division II that year, yeah. from going from not playing for basically four and a half years. So that was pretty amazing. Just, uh, you know, if you don't quit, you just stay after it, you know? Yeah. No. I find that really interesting just because, you know, you almost didn't continue on with football. And if we, you know, then you got offered to be on the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, well, you know, what happened was uh, I didn't get drafted, but, you know, everybody's wondering, well, what's wrong with this guy? He went to <laughs> Oregon, Hawaii, and he finished at Portland State. And Jerry Glanville happened to watch a tape that I had played against Montana, and I threw like seven touchdowns or something. And the, you know, completed 43 out of 52 or whatever. The ball never hit the ground, and and I, and he took it to the Eddie LeBaron, who was the general manager at that time, and and so they flew me to Atlanta, and uh, I signed as a free agent with them. Mel signed also uh, with the Falcons, and you know, it ended up uh, we, you know, I was lucky enough to make the team. Mel got hurt, and. Uh, 
um, you know, wow. I mean, you think about it, you know, going for all those times and never getting to play hardly a down, and then yeah. all of a sudden you get a chance to be a pro, which I've dreamed about my whole life. So what did you learn playing in the NFL? What was the biggest thing you learned? Um, the biggest thing I probably learned was that at that time how blessed I was to be around Mouse and have a passing offense and knew a passing background. And I'm not saying this for any other reason. When I got to Atlanta, it was like archaic. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was so far ahead of the other quarterbacks. I wasn't physically better than those guys, but mentally I could see and grasp and because I had played in a wide open pass offense. And so the things that they were having me to do, we didn't even practice at Portland State. You know, I mean, we, uh, you just read them, knew it before the ball was snapped, where the ball was going to go. So I, I was just blessed that I was around Mouse. Yeah. And if we fast forward, uh, you became the head coach <coughs> for the Atlanta Falcons for three years. And then you were the, for one year, the interim head coach for the San Diego Chargers. Um, what did you learn or what do you feel is the biggest differences between coaching NFL and coaching college players? Well, I get asked that question quite a bit. And, and um, to me, there is no difference. Uh, I coached our Coppola High School kids for in 2000, whatever I was there, 14 or 15, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, the same way that I asked them to do the same things I asked my Atlanta Falcons to do. And... I think a lot of times people aren't asked to do things, go beyond uh, what the, the realm is. They say, well, how is a 16-year-old you know, or 17-year-old going to learn this, what you're doing in Atlanta? Well, guess what? They've never been asked to, to do it before. Are they any smarter at 17 or 18 than they are at 19 or 20 or 21? Uh, they got the same intelligence. They've just never been asked to do uh, those things. So it was really fun to see that. And I think... Uh, the biggest difference that, that, that I find now, in the pros, you, you're in situations where you, the players you, that you're given, you can't cut them. You know, they have, some of them have guaranteed contracts, so you have to be more of a way to get the most out of each individual, and it might be different for you, it might be different for him. So you gotta be a little bit more of a psychologist mm -hmm. that way, whereas in college, if, if you, don't, you don't have a kid, you, you can just sit him down and don't worry about it. You're not going to get a call from the president or the owner. <laughs> Why is he not playing? Yeah. You, know, uh, you make those decisions. So from college, at least uh, you make the decisions as a coach as to who plays in the game. Yeah. All right. Now, Coach, in 1998, UH went winless, 0-12. They actually had an 18-game losing streak in 98. You come in in 1999 with the same players. Now, in my book, I talk about how everything starts with the head coach or the CEO of a company. You come in in 99, you have a nine and four record. Your team wins a share of the WAC championship. You have the same players, just you as the head coach. Why did that happen? Well, um it happens uh, because you know your players end up reflect reflecting the coaches. I hired a very good staff that believed in the things that I believed in. Ron Ron Lee has been running our offense forever. Dan Morrison was at Punahou. Yeah, uh, uh, ran a lot of my camps and believed in what we're doing. And so having a belief in the system of of execution is mandatory. And the other thing that I think that I have always done differently, and I think. People are figuring it out now, but back, you know, you're, you're, talk, you're talking 20 some years ago now that, you know, I believed in positive reinforcement more than, uh, you know, a kick in the rear. Now, some guys need a kick in the rear, <laughs> but that's, I, that's why I hire coaches that can do that kind of thing. Yeah. Because uh, that's not my personality. My personality is put my arm around them, be positive and encourage them and uh, love them. And, you know, I think that that has been probably why I've had success. And the other part of that is I've always been on the leading edge of, of uh, doing things offensively. You know, you know when we took the uh, offense to to nineteen mid eighties, we were running four wide receivers. Nobody was doing that, yeah. and and they it was a communist way to play the game. <laughs> and the, we had to beat the press. We had to beat everybody to continue to do what we did. Well, now, it, you know, I watched the Super Bowl. I watched New England play. They're running everything that we ran in 1987. Now it's okay. Yeah. Uh, but to do what we did, we were on a leading edge all the time of, of 
different ideas. And, and if you're not tweaking those ideas, like I go in Hamilton, I've tweaked and done some things. If you're not changing, and I think that 13 to 18 percent uh, of what we do offensively every year, then they're catching up with you, you know. And so I watch, I watch Kansas City this year a, a whole lot because I thought they were the most innovative team in the game, doing things a little differently. And so you always got to watch and, and, and be ready to adjust. I bet you would love to be coaching Mahomes from Kansas City. I would love to be coaching him. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a good player. Now, every leader has a culture <clears throat> of excellence. Every great leader has a culture of excellence. You've shared a, a, a few of them. What, what do you feel is your culture of excellence like? Well, I don't talk about uh, results. I don't talk, I, I, you know, I, I, I always, well, everybody knows we want to be the best we can be. And we want to win the Grey Cup this year. We want to win the Super Bowl, whatever it is. But I, I believe the culture is, is that you have to be able in a team setting to put the other guy before yourself. Team success has to be a prerequisite to personal success. If, success. if it's not, you're never going to be as good as you can be. And so that's easy to say, uh, but in this day and age with the egos and the different personalities and the selfishness, the guys that win are the ones that everybody come together and, and doesn't care who has success. You know, that you're pushing together, that you're positive, that they love each other, that, you know, I tell the guys all around, I told the University of Hawaii guys this, they're going to forget the games. I don't know scores. You can ask me about a game. I don't remember a score at all. But you ask me about the players and ask me the guys that were in that room, I can tell you everything about them. Yeah. Well, trust and loyalty and respect is huge. Mm -hmm. How do you, so how do you get all of your team members to buy into your Philosophy. Well, you, you gotta you gotta speak it every day. You got and and what you do and what you say has to be the same. And and if you see things, you have to identify them right away in front of the group. I mean, I, if something happened in a game or something happened on the practice field, I would address it in front of everybody else. Good and positive. Good and or, well, good, good and, and bad negative. Yeah. And negative. Yeah. And so no, you know, if if you do it that way. Uh, everybody starts to understand why why for us to be as as good as we can be you have to understand that team success has to be a prerequisite to personal success and if it isn't that way you're never going to win at all yeah now in 2007 mm -hmm. you take universe this is your last year coaching UH football you take the team through the regular season undefeated the team is ranked number 10 in the United States you take them to the Sugar Bowl, first time UH has ever been in a major bowl game. Why did that happen? Well, I think it, it happened because of the uh, previous uh, years that we've built the culture. Uh, you know, we were a very good team that year, but I, I, to this day, think the year before was the best football team I had. And I think because of the success we had the year before and the disappointment, uh, of losing three games. I mean, I tell people this, and it's, it's funny. We, we won, I think we ended up, you have to go back and look. See, I can't even remember <laughs> now. I think we were 12, 11 and three, I think, in 206. And the three losses, we had the ball in our hand to win the game on all three of those losses, yeah. including at Alabama, uh, to tie the score and maybe, uh, and maybe put it into overtime. And I say that had as big an impact because the culture was being laid and then 017 benefited from that confidence, from that belief, from, from hanging together and, 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 and nobody caring who caught the ball. Uh, you, know, if, if, you know, you had four receivers and you couldn't have a guy, Devon Best, catch 15 and Ryan Grice Mullen catch three and he'd be upset yeah. that he didn't catch the ball as many times as Devon. And, and so that culture was laid and uh, I think that our 017 benefited from, from all the things that we've been talking about. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, being, having the players be selfless mm -hmm. and really thinking about, you know, the team first is, is absolutely paramount. Yep, absolutely. Now, you, you know, you trained, you've mentored Nick Rolovich, Timmy mm -hmm. Chang, Colt Brennan. They were good players, but you made them great. What did you do to make them great? 
Well, I believe that to be the best you can be, that it's a, it's a repetition of doing the same thing over and over and over again, so you do it with unconscious competence. In other words, you've thrown that flat route in your sleep a thousand times, yeah. and you put it 18 inches out front, and you can catch it and turn up the field. And, you know, I think the execution of, of doing those things over and over and over, I always get this... Uh, asked all the time, Coach, you, you, your receivers always catch the ball in their hands. Well, we <laughs> demand it that it, they don't catch it in their body. Yeah. You catch it by the news, catch it in the hands, and we live by that for, I mean, every day. In fact, Hamilton kids, are, if they're, they're listening to this, yeah. they're going to they're gonna hear it right now. Uh, but they become better receivers, and they come, become that they can make great plays catching it in their hands. Or if they're body catchers, they never really reach up and try to catch it in their hands. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, to be the best you can be, I believe it's repetitive. Go doing the same things over and over again so you can do them without thinking about them. Because when the pressure's on and it's fourth and one, you don't have time to be thinking about technique, about drops, anything else. It's got to just happen. And they you do that via repetition. Yeah, repetition and fundamentals. Yep. And, and I love hearing that. Coach, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to continue going beyond football. All right. Sounds good. You're watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii with my special <clears throat> guest, Coach June Jones. We will be back in 60 seconds. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m., on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My special guest today is a former NFL head coach of the Atlanta Falcons and the legendary former head coach of our University of Hawaii football team. He is the one and only Coach June Jones, and today we are going beyond football. Coach June, you are currently coaching in the Canadian Football League, the Hamilton mm -hmm. Tiger Cats. Last year you had Heisman Trophy winner John Z Johnny Manziel on your team. What were you doing specifically to help him? Well, that's a good, uh, a good question. I've been a believer that Johnny was one of those rare guys that could lead and, and could be a winner. I think that uh, he, he found himself in a situation where uh, nobody really believed that he was that guy. Even though he was drafted in the first round, they didn't, to me, put around him the, the where for all that I would have done to make him successful. You have to be put in that situation. Um, that happens a lot with quarterbacks. Uh, look at Steve Young. Uh, yeah. You know, Steve Young, everybody said he can't play. Yeah. Well, guess what? He gets with Bill Walsh and he's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so I kind of always had that feeling about Johnny. I was lucky enough to be around him for six weeks. I told him from day one what was expected of him, what I expected him to be, how, I mean, everything from, from the practice to the media to, to how to handle himself after games, all those type of things. I, I'm not sure that he was ever really been coached that way before. Yeah, and he played for me for only six weeks, and we traded him after the first uh, game. And I look back, and it gets back to the repetition thing that I said. I was trying to give him repetitions, but I had Jeremiah Mazzoli and Johnny in preseason. I want to say completed like 72 percent of his passes. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe had six or seven touchdowns, no interceptions, and we traded him. I, I wish that I could have had him the whole time because he's doing that without the repetitions, without, that was just natural, yeah. you know? And had he been in our system long enough, I hate to think what the numbers might have been. 
I, I have a lot of aloha for Jeremiah Mazzoli because he does have all those same skills. He's a leader, he's a winner, he's accurate with the ball, can run. And, and so Johnny was not going to get on the field for a while. And, uh, and so we traded him, and he's in Montreal. And I texted him you know, back and forth and root him on and hope that he makes it. And you never know. And this, this pro football, you may be back with him one day. So yeah. you never know. Well, Masoli is, is doing fantastic, like you said. And he must be so happy to have you there. And I wish you, Johnny Menzio had you longer. Yeah, well, I'm, it's like you say, when you're in college, you, you, you sign up for five years. And if I had Johnny for five years, in the pros, you're not as lucky as that. Now, unfortunately, it was that way when I was playing. If you were drafted in the first round as a quarterback, you might not get on the NFL field, field for three years. But now the money has changed so much. They give you so much money and the media Everybody's driving. Well, let's put Johnny in the game. Well, he may not be ready to play. Yeah. And then you never know what damage may happen. Yeah. Uh, I think that happened to a young kid named uh, Garrett Gilbert, who's playing in the Alliance Football League and played very well last week for Spurrier. Uh, he was booed off the field at 18 years old after winning a national championship at Texas. Well, he comes to SMU his last two years, and it took me almost a year to get him to play what was at that time pretty flawlessly in his, in his last year. So it just takes time. Yeah. Coach, let's talk about adversity. In my book, I, I talk about welcoming adversity and looking forward to challenges. How would you get your players in the right mindset to do the same? Well, you, you, again, you, in football, you got to talk about it. You know, you, you got to, you know, if, if a kid, if a kid, you're, you're down by, uh, by three touchdowns, for example, uh, I constantly say, guys, We've scored three touchdowns in six plays about ten times this year. You know, there's no lead that we can't, you know, we can't uh, overcome. Yeah. And so you you got to have a belief number one that you can, and and you have to be able to uh, understand uh, the the personalities, the the different guys that can make plays. Who are the guys that can make the play? Who are the guys that make a difference in the game? I remember Jerry Glanville. Used to when I was calling plays, he just look at me and go, "Throw the ball to Andre Riser." <laughs> now I, I'm, I've got my mind, but but then I'd call a play, and guess what? Andre'd make play. Yeah. You know, and so you have to. I, that changed how I thought about it. You know, even when I was with Cole, I said, "Get the ball to let's get it to Devon," and then I call a play that I. Well, you know, the coverage is going to dictate where the ball goes, but but he knew why. You know, we were throwing that route yeah. get it to Devon. You know. <laughs> now speaking of challenges. What's been your biggest adversity, your biggest challenge in your life that you had to overcome? Well, there's probably two things. Number one, the biggest one was after my accident. Um, I tore my aorta and, uh, and I was lying in bed. I couldn't move my legs. And, uh, like paralyzed? Paralyzed. And I, didn't, I was unaware of this, but when you tear your aorta, Nine out of ten people never walk again because oh. the blood flow is cut off to the lower extremities, and so they're paralyzed for the rest of their life. Jeez. And so I couldn't walk and uh, couldn't move my legs and didn't feel anything. And, and uh, I remember the doctor telling me uh, when I asked him about it after I was I was in a coma for two or three weeks, and and uh, I remember him uh, saying, "Coach," he put his head down. He said, "You're probably never going to walk again." And of course, that was. Uh, really uh, hard Wow! and from that day forward the only thing I could do for the next I had wires and t tubes going everywhere I said I gotta stand up I gotta I gotta walk I got so finally I took a couple steps into and uh, grabbed a bar of soap and I see the doctor heart guy one time a, a day and and I he came in and I remember showing him the soap and he said what is that and I said I walked in and got the soap oh. And uh, he said, wow, you know, okay. And so then I was just on a commitment for probably three and a half years that I was going to get my legs back to normal. Well, I got them as good as I can get them via some help of some great guys, Elroy Chong being one of them, yeah. uh, Pat Ariki being another one. And, you know, I got um, where I could at least function. I can't run. Uh, hard for me to walk up a hill. But I'm lucky to be alive, so that, that was probably one of them. The other one was when I left SMU, I had a mental overload that just blew me away. I mean, I, I had some things happen. I was contemplating not going back for my last year. Uh, 
uh, I wasn't sleeping, and I had like three or four times where I couldn't remember where I was. I got in my car and drive home, and I went 20 miles past my exit and didn't realize it until I came around. And I just was overloaded with the game, uh, all the things that you're doing uh, in football, and then not getting enough sleep. And so basically, I, I read like Dick Vermeil had, had that same thing happen where he had basically a breakdown. And I think that's what happened to me. So those two things, being able to overcome them, uh, you know, I guess everybody has those issues in life. Uh, you just got to fight through them. Wow, that's that's like really deep stuff right there too. Yeah. I mean, the first example. I mean, I mean, you had mind over matter for sure. Yeah, no, I. There's definitely. I know that's what that was uh, yeah. because after not being able to even move or feel my legs for uh, golly a long time. That's scary. Yeah, uh, that I just was gonna figure out how to get this done, and I get like I said, I worked, I lifted weights, I ran, I jogged, I did everything, but now I, I don't do that anymore. I just walk, uh, and like if I'm playing golf, if I'm on a hilly lie, I, I, I can't hit it very good. But, you know, like I said, you know, hey, everybody has issues. I got my <laughs> issues now. Now my handicap's higher and win more money. Yeah. <laughs> now, Coach June, you know, what's, what's an important lesson you've learned in your life when you look back? Well, I think the biggest thing is uh, never giving up on what you want to do. Um, you know, I had a vision. I remember Steve Barkowski telling me uh, when ESPN was doing a, a, a story about me, uh, and I, I, I find out these things just watching, uh, you know, ESPN one day. I heard Bart say that he asked me in 1977, what did I want to do in my life? And he said, I told him I'm going to be the head coach at the University of Hawaii. That was in 1977. Wow. And, and I know that I always wanted to do that. But, you know, for him to recall that I said that, you know, to him the first time he asked me. So, you know, I, I set goals that way. Uh, I, I remember walking into the first meeting at the University of Hawaii, also on an ESPN deal. They were interviewing a, a couple of my players, and they said, well, when he came in, the first thing he said, we were 118 out of 118. He said, next year we're going to be the number one offense in the NCAA. Oh. And all the kids you know, commented, is this guy nuts? <laughs> you know? and so I probably was a little bit nuts, but I had high expectations. Yeah, high expectation. There's nothing wrong with high no, expectations. No, there isn't. Now, Coach, who is, who's a coach when you were playing mm -hmm. that had such a big positive impact on you and why? Well, uh, I'm going to stay on a positive uh, way. I have a, another guy that I've mentioned, but I'm not going to choose to do that right now. Uh, Mouse Davis and Jerry Glanville had the biggest impact on how I do things. Um, I'll give you an example. Mouse, uh, I think everything I do offensively and the way I treat people, the way I handle the situations, I copied from Mouse. Uh, uh, Jerry Glanville the same way, and I'll tell you Jerry Glanville's story that I've kind of brought into every locker room that I had. We're getting ready to play the Dallas Cowboys on uh, Thanksgiving Day, yeah. and uh, I got Warren Moon as my quarterback, and it's a big game, and you only have, really, you only have two days to practice, because yeah. Monday, they got to give them a one off, and, and so I'm scrambling, trying to get the game plan ready, and so I kind of push everything forward to Wednesday night before the Thursday uh, afternoon game, and Jerry, you know, so I'm thinking I'm going to get this done in the meeting the night before. Well, Jerry Glanville says, hey, guys, boom, 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 closes the door, in walks Travis Tritt and Jerry Jeff Walker and a couple of other guys, and they start playing and singing, and we don't have a meeting. <laughs> and so I go, go out, and I'm thinking, what? You know, this is crazy. What, what, what is this about? Boom, we blow them out of the water the next day. And... Uh, uh, first time I think they had won ever uh, uh, in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, that showed me that the camaraderie and the chemistry and all those intangible things are more important than the X's and O's. And I, I, Jerry had taught me that. Uh, Mouse was that way too. And then uh, Bill Walsh had a big influence on me also the last 10 years of his life. He would come spend time here with Elroy. And I'd get the opportunity to play golf with them and go out to dinner at night. And, and uh, I, I had to ask him. And he came talk to our team. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Coach June, you know, 
you inspire so many people, you know, currently and in the past. Well, I don't know about that. No, <laughs> you do, and and I'm one that that you know you inspire me, and I I really have to say that you definitely go beyond the lines, and I really want to thank you for being on the show today. My pleasure, Russ. Good to, good to see you. Thank you, June. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Beyond the Lines, and a special thank you to my clothing sponsor, Iolani Incorporated. For more information, please visit my website, RustyKamori.com, and my book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all Costco stores in Hawaii. I hope that Coach June and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.